Thanks, Tom. Um, so right away when I started my lecture yesterday, I made a terrible mistake, which you need to correct. So after the lecture, I'm thinking back about it, of course, thinking, oh, that, that went pretty well. But then I realized I forgot to thank Veronica. I was thanking the organizers. I listed a bunch of people, and I forgot to thank Veronica. So <laughs> somehow this, this happened. Veronica, I'm sorry. Thank no you. problem. And <laughs> You're welcome. You know, it, it reminded me a little bit of when you watch people give these Oscar speeches, and they like are all flustered, and they don't know. You thank all these people. And you might say, well, you knew you were lecturing at Tazi for like eight months. You could have, you know. Those Oscar winners, they just find out right then. But when the bright lights go on, everything goes out the window. So uh, please forgive me. And now that the record is set straight, um, uh, we can continue. So um, good. So yesterday we talked a bit about what it is that the bootstrap is trying to do for ADSCFT among uh, many possibilities. And um, today we're going to talk a bit about one of the tools in addressing some of those questions, which is the computation of four-point functions in strongly coupled theories with, with both duals, both from the bulk side and from the boundary side. Uh, first, I want to start, <clears throat> though, just returning to this, this figure, which we had a little less time to discuss than I would have liked. Um, and so I won't recapitulate everything that's, that's in here, because I think we got to some of the main features. but. Um, Maybe I should just first ask if there are any questions people had lingering about um, the different regions of the spectrum of single trace operators in holographic theories and what each one represents. Uh, actually, I have a, maybe a very naive question. Um, what's the meaning of delta gap if you have um, lighter modes? So delta gap is usually when the, I think of gap is that there are no massless particles and then the first mode has that energy. Uh -huh. Right. So here it is referring specifically to the dimension of the lightest single trace operator of spin greater than two. So there's a gap in the single trace higher spin spectrum. Okay. So you can have lower, you can have other excitations, but they have to be lower spin. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? OK, good. So of course, this will be something that we you know, return to uh, directly and indirectly throughout the, the lectures. So let, let me introduce just CFT four-point functions, the constraints of conformal symmetry on them, um, what crossing symmetry is, and then we'll move on to how you compute them in the context of, of ADS CFT um, and what you do with them. So um, I'm going to continue to call uh, my local operators O in general, unless otherwise noted. So let's, for simplicity, consider a four point function of identical scalar primaries O. And uh, using conformal symmetry, We can put this into the following form. There's some power law prefactor where delta is the dimension of O um, times some function, which I'm going to call A, of conformally invariant cross ratios U and B, where U is defined as, as uh, this particular ratio of the squared differences of distances. And V is. A slightly different one. So conformal symmetry allows you to write a four-point function in this way. Uh, the argument for why that is can be found in many places. For example, the Tazi bootstrap notes I referred to yesterday, referred you to rather yesterday. And one can uh, reparameterize these two um, in general complex cross ratios u and v in terms of complex variables z and z bar. Uh, that will be convenient. So let's do that. Here's the parameterization, which is very common. And so let's think of this as a function of z and z bar, which I like better. So um, 
if we think of the complex Z plane, uh, you can use conformal symmetry to put an operator at zero, an operator at one, an operator at infinity. And then the fourth operator can be thought of as sitting uh, in, this, in this plane. Now in Euclidean kinematic Z bar equals Z star, um, but they can be continued away from that to be separate independent complex variables. Um, uh, we won't really need that for today, but you should know that. Okay. So we want to use the OPE to expand our correlator. And there are different channels in which to do this. So we can bring operators together in pairs in different ways. So for example, what I'll call the S channel, we take u to zero, which is small z. Uh, and so here, a can be written as a sum over some intermediate operators phi that are being exchanged between our external operators, which I'm going to uh, denote in this way uh, in terms of the legs of my correlator. Right? So I have operators one, two, three, and four. And this operator phi is being exchanged in the middle. And we have a bunch of operators being exchanged uh, that are inherited from the structure of the LPE between one and two on the one hand and three and four on the other. And phi must appear in both. So multiplied, uh, multiplying whatever kinematic thing this is, is a product of OPE coefficients C1, 2, phi, C3, 4, 5. We can also do this in what I call the T channel, which is the V goes to zero regime. In other words, Z goes to one. And in this case, Well, we're going to expand in the one four goes to two three because that's what makes V small, right? Um, so we have some other sum over some other set of operators in general, a phi prime, one, four, two, three, phi prime in the middle. And now this, uh, excuse me, <laughs> this combination of OPE coefficients. There's also a U-channel expansion around Z equals infinity. That's important for various things, but uh, we won't need to talk about that today. So, so far I've written this as a sum over whatever operators appear in these OPEs, but we can use conformal symmetry even more to package the redundancy of uh, conformal symmetry uh, into what are called conformal blocks. So conformal blocks are given by, defined by, the sum of exchanges and some correlator from an entire conformal multiplet. And by conformal multiplet, I mean, well, the following. You have some primary O, which I here I'm writing as a state, and we can act with that uh, on that with the raising operators of conformal group, namely, uh, the momentum, P mu, any number of times and in many ways, in any way that we can contract the tensor indices, right? So these are all different descendants of the original primary O, dot, dot, dot. And so this whole multiplet um, gets exchanged and conformal symmetry actually relates the OPE coefficients of all these descendants to that of the primary. And as a result, you can once and for all determine the structure of these conformal blocks using conformal symmetry, and then restrict your sum in this decomposition to sums over primaries only, where the kinematic thing that is represented by these stick figures is the conformal block. So we write our four point function in this channel, the yes, S channel. We can now restrict to primary phi, uh, and then we have these phi exchanges. And, and here and elsewhere, I'm going to start sometimes suppressing the actual OP coefficients, although they're always sitting at these vertices. OK, I hope that's not confusing. Um, it is customary. And so now this thing here is the conformal block. 
So it represents the exchange of phi, but also these derivatives of phi. Well, Eric. Yes. It seems like part of your screen is cut off. Really? Yeah. Uh, I wasn't, part. someone else missed it. The left part. The uh -huh. left part. Now it's good. Really? Yeah. It was cut off for, for you also? A little, yeah, it was cut off for me oh. also. But, um, but now it's fine. That's bizarre. OK. Um, let me know if it happens again. Sorry. Sure. Um, OK. So these conformal blocks are sometimes denoted g sub phi. Uh, and, and, and here and elsewhere, I'm suppressing the fact that we sum over different operators. And these operators come with dimensions delta and spins j or l. So, so everything's really a sum over spin and, and delta. Right? So conformal block g sub phi, well, that depends on the dimension of phi and the spin quantum numbers. But once those are specified, um, uh, given the external dimensions, the block is fixed. Um, so yeah, what should be to, to be clear, the block is a is a function of z and z bar. Just as well. yes, yes, it is. Thank you. It is the all of the dependence of on z and z bar is in the block, right? The, so the, the co op coefficients are constants um, in this way of writing things, and all the z and z bar dependence is here, and the leading z and z bar dependence of the block, um, uh, you know, depends on the. Uh, quantum numbers of the exchanged operator phi. And then as you expand this block in powers of z and z bar, the coefficients of the subsequent powers of z and z bar also depend um, on those quantum numbers. In even dimensions, there's a closed form for these conformal blocks, uh, which is basically sums of products of hypergeometric functions. Oops. Uh, for odd dimensions, there is no closed form. Uh, nevertheless, there are efficient approximations, um, many of them, in fact. Um, so for one thing, there is a series expansion, which can just be you know, worked out by hand, level by level, by using the structure of the conformal multiplet. But fortunately, was worked out long ago by Dolan and Osborne in a closed form. It just can't be resummed. So, um, for lots of purposes, the series expansion is just fine. Um, there are also some recursion relations. There are integral representations. And conformal blocks obey uh, what's known as the conformal Casimir equation which is a second order differential equation, which can be derived by noting that every state in the conformal multiplet has the same value of the conformal Casimir by definition of, of a Casimir, and, um, and writing the generators as differential operators, you can turn that fact into a differential equation, which is basically a hypergeometric type in the even dimensional case, but otherwise is just not. OK, and so then there, there's more here. Too. Um, good. So crossing symmetry is associativity of the OPE. So if we're looking at this four-point function of O's, I can use the OPE in different ways. Contract two and three and one and four, uh, or I could contract one and two and three and four, or the third combination, which I didn't say. And so, in terms of these different channel decompositions that I wrote earlier, this is just an equality between those decompositions. And the key point is that the blocks are not crossing symmetric.
what the whole sum must be. So imposing this is powerful. And by that, I mean, if you imagine that you knew some of the data, say, so you know the spectrum of operators over which you're summing, but you don't know the OPE coefficients, then imposing crossing symmetry can help you determine them. Or if you know, you know almost nothing about the operators being summed over even, maybe you just know that there's an identity operator and the fusion of two, the two identical operators O, which are on the outside, and you just want to know what else does there have to be, and that's all I know, crossing symmetry can help answer that question for you too. Can I ask a question? Please. I thought that when you want to use the OP to simplify correlators, you can only do the OP between two operators if there's no other operator inserted in between them so that you can bring the one operator to the other. So I, I see, I don't see any way in which you can possibly do uh, all three of these OPE channels at once, like it, probably at least in one or two of those ways of bringing operators together, you're going to hit an operator insertion along the way. If you just think about four points in a plane or on mm -hmm. the Riemann sphere. Yeah, good. So, so each channel converges in a certain region and crossing is useful when you equate two expansions that have overlapping uh, region of convergence. So um, okay. that's where you want to use a given crossing relation, uh, but in different regions of the complex plane, you have to, you're allowed to do different things. Okay, so each crossing relation only works for a certain subset of points. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Sure. As, as I'll try to remark toward the very end, the crossing symmetry itself can be reformulated in a way which makes no reference to the blocks and, and really to the position dependence at all. What, what you're saying, well, we, the point you're bringing up is still relevant there, but you can almost you can almost just forget about the blocks. Um, there, there are other form, formal issues with phrasing it that way. I'll try to say this at the end, and if I don't, then then you can ask me the questions. But I'll try to explain what I mean. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. So. It's powerful, but uh, by, by, by now you've surely heard about this. Um, there are lots of numerical studies, some of which I hinted at yesterday, and there is a lot of, of analytic uh, progress being made too, uh, you know, more and more every day, I would say. Um, I'm sure there's more, more to come. This isn't a talk about um, the bootstrap just in the CFT context per se. So I, you know, that, that of course, well, and has been the subject of an entire Tazi lecture series. If you were to give though, a lecture about the bootstrap just strictly in the CFT context, you would have to point out what's known as the light cone bootstrap, which is one of the first and still most powerful analytic approaches to solving crossing in general CFTs. So let me just mention this. For your knowledge, and perhaps you can follow up on it if, if you like. The point of the light cone bootstrap is to solve crossing in the regime z much less than one minus z bar, much less than one. So you take small z, then you take z bar to one, and then you solve crossing. This was done first in some papers at the end of 2012, uh, one by Fitzpatrick et al. and one by uh, Komodati and Dubuaydov. I will get the references in this document um, uh, on the wiki, which for those of you who didn't uh, notice, I'm, I've put with some references and sort of a paragraph about the papers I referenced, um, how they fit into the general story that I was trying to tell yesterday. And I'll do that today, again, with every reference that I mentioned here and maybe some others, okay. Um, good. So they solved crossing in this regime. And uh, so if I said to say for now that the main conclusion is that if you have operators O1 and O2 in your CFT, then uh, the CFT also has an infinite tower of other operator. 
of other operators, uh, which are primaries, uh, which have dimensions delta equals delta one plus delta two plus two n plus L, where L is the spin, plus some number over L to the D minus two uh, and L becoming asymptotically large. So in other words, at asymptotically large spin, all CFTs look like they have this free Fox space of operators comprised of gluing other operators together to make composites. And the anomalous dimension is one over L to the D minus two, where D is the dimension of the CFT, uh, was computed. It was computed by using this method. Um, and a whole systematic machinery for, for understanding this has been developed in the years since. This conclusion more, also generalizes, this is the simple version, the main punchline. Are there more assumptions here? Because what about like rational CFTs in dimension two? Hmm. Yeah, so this is for dimension greater than two. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and actually in the fourth lecture, I hope to come back to that, but it's important that D is greater than two. And just to give a snippet of why, a key point here is that there is a gap in twist between the identity operator and the next lowest twist operator. Twist is defined as the dimension minus the spin. And in two dimensions, the holomorphic stress tensor in any of its composites have zero twist. And so there is no gap between the vacuum and uh, the next operator. But in D dimensions, the, the stress tensor has twist D minus two. And indeed, this D minus two over here is this D minus two over here. Okay, so any other questions? This, is, this concludes the um, kind of just CFT background part before we transition to large end correlators. Okay, good. So we're going to study correlators at, at large end and especially in strongly coupled theories. Um, And this means, from the holographic point of view, computing Witten diagrams, which Mukund introduced in his lectures. And we want to develop the 1 over n or the 1 over c expansion of these correlators and ask what kind of information do they contain? What are we really computing when we compute Witten diagrams? And what are the essential data that characterize um, <clears throat> a large? Um, large NCFT of the holographic type. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to use C, but you know, sometimes you see conventions where C is just taken to be parameterized by some new fictional parameter n. Usually, the canonical scaling people like to choose is n squared because that's what it is in gauge theories. Okay, um, so that, that's just a side remark related related to my. <clears throat> some of the clumsiness about using n and c yesterday, often people just say, we're going to define c as n squared, and then we can talk about n and c. Okay. So just something to look out for when you look in the papers. OK. Good. So what are Witten diagrams? Witten diagrams are just ADS Feynman diagrams. I have a joke about these. So Witten's insight was just to take a Feynman diagram and draw a circle around it. And that's why he has a new thing now. So um, <clears throat> good. So let's just draw some, some random ADS alignment diagrams. So here's a simple one. Here's a slightly more complicated one. Here's a slightly more complicated one. Here's an even more complicated one, dot, dot, dot. I'm restricting to four points just because that's what we'll do. Of course, you could draw endpoint diagrams. Um, those have been somewhat studied, um, but definitely less so. And in the bootstrap at large, endpoint functions have been less studied than four point functions. So this diagram, this first one on the left, is a disconnected diagram. 
um, it's just free propagation. And so in the one over C counting, this would just be order C to the zero, where, where we're just taking products of two point functions and I'm imagining a normalization where two point functions of these single trace operators are normalized to be of order C to the zero. Okay. Now these guys here are connected, three level diagrams. And so they would contribute at order one over C in the large C expansion of some four point function. This of course is a one loop diagram. This would contribute at order one over C squared. And in making these statements, I'm assuming that all the vertices, the interactions scale with um, canonical powers of, of one over C or one over root C. That kind of assumption is often baked into arguments people make about the space of holographic CFTs, but I should say it's not something that has to be the case for every, every family of large C theories, but um, you want to think of there being some bulk action where there is a one over G Newton out front and all of the interaction vertices that are in the Lagrangian um, just have order one factors in, in units of G Newton. Right? And so then you get this kind of expansion. This is the case so, for all controlled constructions. So, sorry, you are saying the three point vertex is one over root C, but the four point vertex is one over C, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, in general, the endpoint vertex is, well, every time you add an n, you add a one over root c, whatever that scaling is. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK. So um, let's start with the c to the 0 disconnected diagrams. And then we'll talk about the connected diagrams. The loops, maybe we'll talk about tomorrow. Is um, there intuition for this? Like why for endpoint vertex, it should be like one over C to the uh, N over two or? Uh, well, you can, you can make an argument based on, um, so once you have a kind of action that I articulated before, you can see what types of factors, vertices and propagators carry, and then, and then just sort of algorithmically determine this. I see. Yeah. The question is really whether you have whether an action has to have that kind of scaling. Um, mm -hmm. But once it does, then what I said is not too hard to to establish. Um, okay. Um, just a, a question about that assumption. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit odd to think that all the interaction strengths scale in the bulk theory scale with the G Newton. Is there a reason why you're making that assumption? Uh, let me give you two reasons. But, so first of all, I, I agree that it's not um, for sure that that always has to be the case. But first of all, in um, in controlled compactifications in the context of string theory, or really supergravity, that's what happens. Um, and OK, maybe you say lamppost, lamppost, and, and fine. But then there was a recent, um, in, in this recent paper about the sharp boundaries for Swampland and then the ADS version of that by Karen Huo et al. that I referred to yesterday. They show in a highly symmetric setting, namely that of n equals four um, amplitudes, that the types of constraints they work with, which are essentially a form of, of causality and, and crossing, um, show you that in that setting, all the interactions, the quartic interactions, do have to scale with G Newton. So they're assuming there's some EFT, um, which is weakly coupled up to some massive scale, which is well below the Planck scale. And they assume some you know, other sort of mild things. And out from this pops a bound on these four point functions, which has a G Newton built into it necessarily. So all of the interactions necessarily scale in the way that I've described when you have n equals four supersymmetry. And that's on pretty general grounds. That's an independent kind of argument. And one might imagine that something like that would, would um, be possible to show more generally, or at least maybe with a little bit of supersymmetry or something. But Cool. That, thanks. Sure. That can be found in like a later section of their small plan paper, maybe the second to last section. OK, so good. 
So the disconnected diagram, well, if you are computing at order c to the zero, a correlator, well, here I've just drawn one, one channel, right? But um, we really have diagrams in all three channels. So three, four, and then we'd have with the same numbering, we'd have this, and then the U channel one, which is always annoying to draw. Uh, and so it's clear that right, this first diagram just gives a one over x one two, x three four to the two delta, just products of two point functions. And then the obvious permutations hold here. And so just extracting the overall power law factor involving the x's, the corresponding four point function is just one plus z z bar over one minus z, one minus z bar all to the delta plus z z bar to the delta, where each of these terms corresponds to the graph above it. So this is the answer. Um, it's crossing symmetric uh, by construction, of course, um, because the holographic dictionary instructs you to sum explicitly over all the channels. And so if you decompose this into conformal blocks, well, what will you get? So let's decompose it in this in the S channel, which is small z. So first we get the identity. Uh, and then we're going to get two infinite sums. Sum over some number n and sum over L of double trace exchanges. So these operators O, O, N comma L are these double trace composites. Uh, and this is a shorthand for a sandwiching of a bunch of derivatives by two O's. So N is like a um, center of mass kind of quantum number in the bulk, which counts how many powers of del squared you have. And then L counts the spin, and that's just how many open derivatives you have. And these act both ways, and you subtract traces to make it primary and so on. But O, O, N comma L is a shorthand for these double trace composites. They have dimension uh, two delta plus two N plus L. And at this order, that's the exact dimension because this is just free fields in the bulk. This whole disconnected Construction um, where there are no interactions uh, is not as generalized free fields. So everything here is just the four point function of generalized free fields. And it's called that just because in CFT terms, you have some crossing symmetric correlator where delta can be an arbitrary parameter, but in ADS, you literally have a free elementary field. So generalized free fields. Can I ask a question? Yes, I'm just a little confused. Is it obvious to see why that's the expansion in conformal blocks? I think it just uh, not exactly, but okay. it it will it is for the first term in the sense that when we expand at small z, so for example, um, the OPE coefficient between the two O's and then the first composite, the scalar with n equals zero, is just the coefficient of z z bar to the delta. So, you know, at small z, this is just two, right? So uh, first of all, just expanding at small z, you see that there's an operator um, whose dimension is two delta. And, and up here, there's, there's a delta, but the conformal blocks start uh, in the small z limit with a dependence dimension minus spin over two. So you see from this correlator that the leading guy, the zero comma zero one, uh, is just manifestly there because it's small z, you're just doing you know, a very simple expansion. Expanding at higher and higher orders, you see that you're just going to get powers of z and z bar shifted by integers. Um, and a slightly more care tells you that it's exactly this type of spectrum. OK. So this was um, c to the 0, so no interactions. Obviously, things become more interesting 
at order one over C, where we have connected four point functions. Um, and in order one over C, two things happen. Okay. So the first is that you have single trace exchanges, things like C O O phi. And this would scale like one over root C canonically. For example, in a theory of a scalar coupled to gravity, you'd always have graviton exchange. Uh, and the double trace data gets corrected. So if we establish a shorthand A and comma L to be the squared OP coefficient of the external operators with the N comma L double trace, then this has a one over C expansion where the leading term is the generalized free field result, which I'm generating with a zero superscript, which just looks like a dot, but it's supposed to be a zero. Um, and then there's going to be some one over C correction and higher orders likewise. And the dimensions also receive corrections. So part of what one is computing when you compute tree level correlators are these corrections. And this thing here can be interpreted as a binding energy in ADS of this two particle state due to the interactions, say due to the gravitational interaction. <clears throat> of course, there's also lots of interesting data in the single trace part, but given some single trace spectrum, so you have some Lagrangian, there's some exchanges, um, then you can extract from that the effect on these composite operators. So both of these things are what are being computed at tree level. Um, there are two types of diagrams, contact diagrams and exchange diagrams. So the contact diagrams will be um, so this also important for, for tomorrow's discussion. Um, so Let's draw this. So contact diagram means you have some cortic, in this case, a four-point function, so cortic interaction in the bulk, something like five to the fourth. And you know, in view of time and, and uh, interest, I'm not going to explicitly write out this, this thing in its full glory. Um, but I think you, you already know basically how you compute this. You have some interaction point, which I'm going to put in orange. This has to get integrated over all of ADS. Otherwise, you don't get a, a conformally covariant object. And at each of these legs, you have a bulk to boundary propagator uh, for the appropriate field. So you multiply these four propagators together. You integrate them over the common bulk point, And that defines the answer. Sometimes you can do the integral, sometimes you can't. Um, in all cases, this is known as a D function, which is a function of the dimensions of the external operators. And when there are, say, integers, you can write this in terms of logs and dialogs. <clears throat> We're interested in the CFT decomposition of this thing. And, sorry, yeah. to debug for tomorrow. So this decomposes into double trace operators only. So we're getting corrections to these OP coefficients from before and to these anomalous uh, dimensions. A key point here is that these have support only on spins less than or equal to capital L, where L is roughly speaking the number of derivatives in the vertex divided by two. So let me try to explain these features of contact diagrams. First, it sort of looks like there are no single trace exchanges, right? Because you just have some vertex and you have the external fields coming in. Um, and so where would a single trace operator be? Right? It's, not, it's not in the bulk, so it's not going to be on the boundary. And that's a very heuristic way to think about this, but it's true. Um, and a uh, less heuristic way, but still a useful mnemonic that can be made rigorous, is to think of cutting this diagram. So if you make a kind of cut like this, 
through these two lines. Uh, that corresponds to the exchange of a one, two double trace operator in the CFT side. And you can also cut this way. Whoa, that was not at all supposed to happen. <laughs> Good. You can also cut this way. And this gives you a three, four exchange in the CFT side. So drawing the diagrams this way, you can just sort of think of cutting them in different places. And that tells you what you get. This tells you what you get in an S-channel decomposition. If I cut this horizontally, then I'd get a 1-4 and a 2-3. And indeed, that's what would appear in a T-channel decomposition. 1-4 goes to 2-3. I get the, those, those composites appearing in that channel. <clears throat> this condition on the spins can be thought of in the following way. Unless you have derivatives of the vertex, then the vertex can't host the exchange of spinning operators. So imagine you sort of stretch the vertex out a little bit so that something is being exchanged as if you're integrating out some heavy particle, that thing has some spin. And so correspondingly on the CFT side, uh, that bounds the spin of the operators that can be exchanged. This is the sort of intuitive way to think about it and explicit calculation bears, bears this out. So, so what example, do you mean by cutting? I, so by, by cutting, I mean, um, at this level, just drawing a line through the canonical way to draw this diagram and asking, which of, the, which of the bulk lines it crosses. <clears throat> and when it crosses, so, so yeah, let, let me sort of, not sure I've, so, so when you make this kind of cut, <clears throat> this line crossed a three and a four, okay? And so that means that if I decompose the correlator in the S channel, there's going to be a three, four composite that's going to appear in the conformal block decomposition. Is that supposed to be obvious? Like, uh, I, I don't, I'm not seeing it that just because the line cut is three, line cuts three and four. It, it's not it's, really supposed to be obvious. It, it's similar to things that are true about scattering amplitudes, but mm -hmm. it's not really supposed to be obvious. And it's not indeed how that was first inferred. Um, th this notion was, was first sort of talked about by some papers by Fitzpatrick and Kaplan. And then in more recent years, you can systematize this one, one can systematize this cutting procedure, generalize it to loops as well, where when you have loops in, in the bulk, you can ask what is being exchanged from the boundary and the answer is given by the same kind of cutting mnemonic. Um, but, but again, you know, what, what, are the, what, what could the choices have been, right? So everything that could possibly be exchanged in the CFT side has to be made of the external operators. And if there were higher than double trace operators, that would actually violate the one over C counting um, you, you at a, a tree level for a four point function, those cannot appear. So it would have to be some double trace operators. And when you pick a direction, so, you know, if I wanted to, de to decompose this thing um, in the S channel, which is one, two goes to three, four, then, well, any operator appearing in that decomposition has to appear in the one, two OPE. Um, yes. So we're looking at something in order one over C. So what that means is that there's going to be some OP coefficient C1, 2, I, C, 3, 4, I. We want this to be order 1 over C. And each of these, these corrections here is of order 1 over C. So at one vertex, you need to have a correction. At the other vertex, you need to have a generalized free field result. And the only thing appearing in the 1, 2 OPE uh, in a generalized free field theory are composites of 1 and 2. Yeah, OK. Thanks. So for example, yeah, if phi is a one, two composite, then on this side, you get a C to the zero generalized free field OP coefficient. And over here, you get a one over C correction and likewise for three, four composites. So I think that's a fuller explanation. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Um, okay, so let me just say in contrast what exchange diagrams look like. Because they are they are richer, um, and so we know how to draw this. Now we have two bulk points, and there is a field being exchanged. We have external propagators for these operators, and now we have a bulk to bulk propagator for some bulk field. Let's call it phi. One question. Yes. 
for this contact diagram does the uh, d functions can be expanded in terms of your uh, g functions that is the uh, the conformal the blocks yes 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 i mean so, is it very trivial i mean is there any intuition of what what the coefficient should be or how things look uh no i would say there's no intuition and one has to do computations and over the years there have been many computations trying to make that as efficient as possible okay there by this point is certainly for for fixed vertices with some fixed number of derivatives there it's very algorithmic you can go and extract the, i'm saying the, i'm saying you are writing this l less than equal to capital l and oh, all yes. these inferences mm -hmm. are coming from that expansion or it's just an extra assumption oh this l less than or equal to l thing yes capital l yes yeah not an assumption not an assumption oh so that is that is an output from computation and i tried to sort of explain it physically um yeah yeah thanks thank you mm -hmm. um good so now for the exchange diagram, well, what is the CFT decomposition of this thing? Well, actually it depends if you do it in the direct channel or in the cross channel. So here I've written an S channel exchange. So if I decompose this in what I call the direct channel, which here is the S channel. Um, so just to make that totally clear with what we've been using before, if we decompose it into conformal blocks that look like this, um, then this includes the single trace exchange of the operator dual to phi plus some double trace exchanges. Uh, and the spin of those double trace exchanges is bounded above by the spin of phi. So, uh, right, it, it's what you'd expect the single trace exchange would show up because I'm taking this bulk diagram. It looks like a conformal block. I mean, I've maybe done a trick of drawing, but you know, you have some exchange in the bulk, and each bulk operator is dual to some boundary operator, and so that conformal block will appear when you decompose this thing. You also get some double trace pieces, and you can try to understand this by the sort of cutting mnemonic I said before. Right? If I cut down the middle, that corresponds to the CFT single trace exchange, and if I cut along the sides, then I get these other double trace pieces. You can also think of the fact that because these two bulk points are integrated over the full bulk. There'll be some region where they come close. And then it looks basically like a contact diagram. So you're going to get some double trace contributions from that region of integration. These are basically equivalent ways of thinking about it as far as I'm concerned. Uh, in the cross channel, though, so if I decompose this into T channel blocks, which I'm free to try to do, um, then you just get double trace exchanges. And the spin is unbounded. You just get double trace exchanges because you're decomposing in, in cross channel blocks. And so from that perspective, this bulk interaction looks like some non-local sum of, of contact diagrams, which are expanded in some funny direction. And so um, you don't get the single trace exchange when you expand it in the cross channel. But of course, you should remember that you know, when you compute a full amplitude, you're summing over all channels. So, no matter, so if you have some identical four-point function, identical operator four-point function, there will be some channel where, say, the graviton is exchanged. Um, or some, if there's a three-point coupling, it will be exchanged in some channel. So whatever channel you pick, you're going to get that, that exchange appearing. And of course, this thing is causing symmetric, so it really doesn't matter what channel you pick. Uh, uh, it never does. OK, so this is a bit of the mechanics of, of these things. Um, let me make some comments about their essential features, more than what I've already said. So first, it, I've said this a few times, but it's important to, to write this. Um, any holographic correlator is a sum of wooden diagrams in all channels. So this is manifestly crossing metric. To me, this is actually 
an amazing thing about what idea CFT tells us about strongly coupled CFTs, that there is some space, some way in which you can compute four point functions in which they are manifestly crossing symmetric and still also just a discrete sum over a bunch of exchanges. If you are just working on the CFT side, um, it is hard to see crossing symmetry a lot of the time if all you're given are some OP data or some low-lying operators in some, in some channel. People have tried to work on the CFT side to implement manifestly crossing symmetric approaches to computing four-point functions. Um, this goes under the name more recently of the uh, Mellon Polyakov or Polyakov Mellon bootstrap. And the inspiration for that idea was, well, partly some old paper of Polyakov, but also um, the structure of holographic correlators. So the idea there was, can, can we use what we know about holographic correlators to rewrite four-point functions of any CFT as sums of not conformal blocks, but actually uh, crossing symmetric conformal blocks, which end up being essentially sums of exchange written diagrams. So work was put into trying to understand to what extent those form a basis and what one needs to do to tweak that. But um, putting that aside, just in the realm of holographic correlators, it's just pretty fascinating that you know this basic element of the holographic dictionary is telling us something which is at odds with the way you usually learn about CFT from, from the ground up. Not at odds with, but just at least you know revealing of some interesting structure. Um, so we talked about the mnemonic of cutting. Um, you might ask, what is the dual of a conformal block? Um, this is something that I answered in some work from 2015. It's what's known as a geodesic Witten diagram. This was a paper with Elliot Hijano, Per Krauss, and River Snively. Um, and what is a geodesic Witten diagram? It's an exchange diagram where um, instead of integrating these points over all of ADS, you integrate them over geodesics that connect the pairs of boundary points, which I've drawn here as these orange dashed lines. Okay. So you restrict the region of integration, and instead of computing this infinite sum of conformal blocks where you have a single trace exchange and all these double traces, this localizes that infinite sum onto just the single trace exchange. So this thing equals, so we have some intermediate phi here, this equals a single conformal block for the exchange of the operator dual to phi. We felt this was important because in, in CFT, when you compute correlators, conformal blocks are essential. They get rid of the redundant symmetry information for you once and for all. And for many years in computing holographic correlators, that wasn't a core part of the way that was done. Uh, on the other hand, this observation ends up not being so critical for doing bootstrap and holographic correlators, I should say. Um, for example, if you're trying to decompose a sum of, of diagrams in all channels um, into a single channel in the CFT side, then this trick is not very helpful because you have diagrams you have to decompose in the cross channel, whereas the geodesic wind diagram most naturally gives you a, a conformal block in the direct channel. Um, um, and so, so what does it mean by dual to conformal blocks? Like, uh, yeah, so good, so I mean, Right. Dual is a little bit of a misnomer in the sense that these two objects are equal, provably equal. Um, and so the word dual kind of invokes dynamics, but actually here we're just viewing the ADS side as a conformal computer and you have an integral which is associated to this geodesic Witten diagram and you can show that it's equal to the expression for okay. a conformal block. And I also one question that previously the Witten diagram was an integral over the full ADS volume. Now mm -hmm. you are integrating over a line, right? Because it's a yes. geodesic line. And mm -hmm. you are saying that these two answers are the same. I'm saying that when you do this geodesic integral, instead of the full yes. ADS integral, you get a conformal block, a single conformal oh, block. One of the conformal blocks. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, so one. And how to select one of the conformal blocks? Like, uh... Uh, it's just the conformal block corresponding to the exchange of the operator dual to the exchange field in the bulk. Okay. Okay. So yeah. Yes. So this is really a kinematic e equality, but it also allows you to decompose an exchange diagram extremely efficiently 
into direct channel blocks because you don't have to do any integrals. You put in a little work and then you, you show that the result is a sum of a bunch of these geodesic things, but then you having identified those with conformal blocks are done. Mm -hmm. You just read off the coefficients. But again, I, I don't want to um, uh, overemphasize this. It, I, I think it's a useful entry in the dictionary and it was important to establish, but when you're trying to um, bootstrap the space of holographic theories, then there are better things to, to do. Can I get double twist blocks from this construction as well? Double twist blocks. Like this, um, this will give me single trace block. Well, so it doesn't matter what, how you think of this intermediate operator. It's just parameterized by be. some quantum numbers and away you go. But okay. for, for double twists, actually, there could be, um, so the, the answer is yes. If this operator has the dimensions corresponding to double twists, maybe the external operators, then you, this still works, except actually, instead of a conformal block, you get a linear combination of the block and its derivative um, because you, there are extra sort of singularities that appear in this integral. And so th there are the usual kinds of subtleties, but they're I all see. part of the package and that's the way it should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks. Sure. Okay. Um, so finally, uh, the, the last comment before sort of turning to bootstrap approaches to computing holographic correlators, which um, I will only probably get to, and that's fine, is that it's important to, to summarize some of what we've said. The double trace data is fixed by the single trace data modulo contact terms. Right, so we have these two different types of diagrams. The contact diagrams give you double trace contributions. So do the single trace guys, in other words, the exchanges. Um, and so module of the contact diagrams, right? For every exchange diagram, there's some contribution to the double trace data. Um, so this kind of fact that the double trace data is almost, or at least mostly determined by the single trace data is especially clear in the Mellon formalism for computing holographic correlators. Um, perhaps we'll talk about this tomorrow. Um, there's also a nice discussion of this in Drop Panadonis's Tazi notes. Um, and the contact terms are constrained. So one is not just free to add whatever contact terms one wants to some low energy effective action and be consistent with all principles of physics. We'll talk about that tomorrow too. <clears throat> okay, so in the remaining time, I want to talk about some bootstrap approaches to computing correlators. And so, good. Perhaps we'll talk about two separate types of approaches, um, but perhaps not. Let's see. The first is to talk about a top-down case, so to speak, where we want to ask about strongly coupled 4D n equals 4 to Brian Mills. At leading order in the one over C expansion, where we work at tree level in ADS. So, uh, of course, this was one of the first things people wanted to do when ADS CFT was invented. There's a beautiful series of papers by uh, Doker, Freeman, Rastelli, Mathur, Matusis, um, which computed some correlators of the stress tensor multiplet in n equals four super grand mills from supergravity. So, Recall that this operator O2 from yesterday uh, is the superconformal primary in the stress tensor multiplet. And the operators in the stress tensor multiplet are those exactly those which are dual to the massless fields of ADS5 massless uh, maximal supergravity. So um, what these authors did was, let's go over here. They computed 
it's the four point function of O2, which I'll write as two, 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 at order one over C, which is tree level supergravity in ADS5. Um, this was done in 1999 by brute force. Um, the explicit result is, I mean, nice if you've had experience with holographic correlators, otherwise it's not the most enlightening thing. Um, and since we, we have an eye toward what the conformal field theory content is of these kinds of computations, let me just quote um, the anomalous dimensions of these double trace operators of these 20 prime uh, scalars. Um, in particular, there are some um, unprotected composites of these two, uh, these two operators, these 20 primes. Um, and so their anomalous dimensions, gamma and L, at tree level are equal to the following formula, which is useful to see. This is the closest we'll get to experiment in these lectures. So it's fun to write explicit formulas for real theories. Um, and this is a pretty nice compact expression. Supersymmetry definitely helps. Um, although it's not critical to the to the exact form of this, um, note that for all n and l, whoops, these anomalous dimensions are negative. Okay, that actually turns out to be a general feature of anomalous dimensions um, in uh, weakly coupled bulk queries with low spin matter, um, at least down to say scalar spin zero or spin two, where funny non-analytic things can happen in the spin. Um, and so this was a brute force calculation, but so where does the bootstrap come in? Um, that's where modern methods come into play. And actually I'm gonna quote two different papers by Leonardo Ristelli. So I guess he's, uh, he's to blame for a lot of the beautiful results here. Um, so, These results were reproduced and indeed significantly extended by the bootstrap. And here by bootstrap, I mean CFT computations, no computation of Witten diagrams, um, actual field theory calculations. So how is that possible? We're talking about strongly coupled down equals four. Well, let me explain what I mean. Some information is being used that was learned from the bulk. Of course, retrospect is useful. Um, but let me, let me explain. So first, um, there's a nice paper by Beam Rostelli Van Rees that I referred to yesterday. Um, and so what they did is they just looked at the n equals four crossing equation for the four point function of these 20 prime operators. They're not looking at any particular value of central charge. They're not sensitive to the exact value of the coupling because they are just looking at some four point function of some operator and asking how it behaves when you solve crossing. And so they are trying to solve the following problem, the general version of which I mentioned yesterday. They say, we're, we're looking at the OPE of two of these 20 prime operators. Uh, this includes the identity. And then there's going to be a bunch of protected operators, which I'm not writing because their dimensions are, are known and fixed. Um, but there's going to be some sum over spins of some unprotected operators. And let's ask, can we bound the dimensions of the lightest operators appearing in this OPE of whatever low spins, zero, two, four? And well, the answer is yes, they could. And here's what they got. Okay. So I'm gonna make a plot of one over C, where C is just an OPE coefficient appearing in this four point function. So it's a parameter that they can they can tune. And we're going to write the dimension delta L star, which are the dimensions of these light operators of spin L, lightest operators of spin L, minus their spins. So this is the twist of these low-lying operators. Now, let me just draw this for a second. Um, good, that's actually. Here's the value for, here's what they found near the origin uh, in this, in, in one over C. So 
So here I'm plotting the first three spins. And of course, I'm exaggerating a bit to make a point, which I will explain shortly. So we want to look at this plot near infinite central charge, Okay, so near, near this region where they hit 4. So all these lines hit 4, and the slopes of these lines all match the formula that I gave on the top half of this slide, where you plug in n equals 0 to get the leading twist guy of spin L, and you plug in either L equals 0, 2, or 4. So the slopes match this holographic result at strong coupling for uh, the pertinent values of L. And this is a pretty remarkable result because they did not put in strong coupling. They're just looking at the spectrum of this OPE, and they're looking at it as a function of central charge. And when you go to large central charge, well, what are these slopes? These are anomalous dimensions. And they find that the anomalous dimensions um, of their plot essentially saturate the known value as computed from actual supergravity. And just to clarify a point which I realize I've been unclear about, the plots they have are exclusion plots. Above these lines, the region is excluded. Okay. But it turns out that these lines, so these lines are the upper bound of what is allowed. So for example, for the scalar region, the dimension of the lightest scalar appearing in this OPE is somewhere in this blue region. And the slope over here turns out to be uh, gamma 0, comma 0 as computed from supergravity. So the strongly coupled theory seems to saturate these bootstrap bounds, which are derived in complete generality. So this very much was not a priori guaranteed. And it tells you something which sort of you might have said was natural, that the strongly coupled theory seems to saturate the allowed values of parameters. But here they're deriving it just purely from rigorous crossing considerations. Um, and well, deriving is not quite the right word, but, but showing experimentally that these values lie, um, lie on, their, on their plot. Have any questions about this? Because I perhaps was a little elliptic in explaining the meaning of this plot. Maybe I, if there was one thing I would reemphasize in thinking back to the way I explained that, I would just say again, when you have a coupling, um, you know, G Yang Mills, that's not explicitly visible in your OPE decomposition. All the dimensions of operators would be functions of G in real life. But you know, for some value of G, there's going to be some extremal value of G where the allowed largest dimension is saturates some bound. Okay. And so you use the non-BPS data, this unprotected data, as a proxy for, um, for the dependence on the coupling. So you might ask, you know, away from that boundary, how does the OPE data behave? And well, really, you know, that's a very hard problem for the bootstrap to access how to sort of trace the conformal manifold in the presence of an exactly marginal coupling just by using um, the CFT data. But here, what is being shown is that at least at large C, the saturating value for these plots is that which was computed explicitly by supergravity, which is just really beautiful. OK, um, and I've got about three or four minutes left or something. Um, and so, OK, these, these well, that's, that's that. Um, there was also a, a set of um, papers by Rostelli and Zhao, who actually went so far as to bootstrap the 2224 point function at strong coupling without actually computing Witten diagrams. So they, they are writing down the explicit form of this correlator at tree level, which was computed by brute force in 1999 um, by summing Witten diagrams of the type I described earlier. So how do they do this? Um, well, so they used a bootstrap ansatz, where essentially they combined various consistency requirements that this correlator must impose and then guessed and conjectured that there was a unique answer, which was later proven to be correct. Um, I don't have the machinery to 
fully explain what they did, but let me just say what they imposed. Hopefully this will be a some value. So first they said, okay, this must be crossing symmetric. Then they said, okay, it must be n equals four covariant. And in particular, in the decomposition of the four-point function, it must include operators in the respective R symmetry channels. Um, and some of those operators are um, protected, and those give some piece of the correlator, but it's the unprotected piece, which they really wanted to bootstrap. Um, and so here is where they got clever. So they used some knowledge of the single trace spectrum at large coupling. Um, in particular, at large coupling n equals four super Yang mills, the single trace super conformal primaries are this operator O2 we've been talking about. And that's an infinite tower uh, OP, which are half BPS super conformal primaries with dimension P in a particular representation of SU4. But in the O2, O2, OPE, actually this is pretty much overkill, um, SU4 selection rules tell you that you just have the identity and then O2, and then multi-traces. No other single trace operators appear. There's some subtlety with O4, but um, anyway, no, no other single trace operators appear besides this. And so this strongly constrains the analytic structure of the correlator that one could possibly get. And finally, so they said that, well, in the flat space limit, this must behave in a certain way because we're interested in the correlator at strong coupling where um, so we know in the back of our minds, the bulk theory is two derivatives and in the flat space limit, um, the scaling at high energies of this ADS amplitude so as to reproduce a flat space S matrix should have a certain behavior. This is where they encode the strong couplingness because if the bulk theory had stringy corrections, in the flat base limit would also reflect that. Um, so they are using some hindsight from what we know about strongly coupled n equals four, but this turns out to be enough to guess the answer uh, and, and indeed to generalize this to an infinite set of correlators, P1, P2, P3, P4 at strong coupling and quarter one over C where these Ps represent these other half BPS operators in the spectrum of the n equals four theory. And these, for, except for low values of P, had not actually been computed in any other way. So this is quite a, quite a nice result. Okay, so we're out of time, um, but I hope to have conveyed what the bootstrap uh, could do, at least in part in sort of allowing you to not have to compute Witten diagrams every time you want to learn something about a strongly coupled CFT. Um, there is of course more to say and um, well, I will say it, but tomorrow. Um, so tomorrow we'll continue this. Um, perhaps I'll add some remarks that I was um, thinking about adding today. Um, but we'll talk more about, so. so they continued for a little bit, perhaps, but then we'll talk more about the space of holographic CFTs. Um, this will involve this HPPS paper in particular, which set off this whole subject. Um, uh, and whether and how one can constrain the single trace part of the spectrum, which is really kind of the, the bootstrap question about what kinds of theories you can have. Um, this will allow us to talk about the role of extra dimensions. Um, and so, let me just conclude uh, with that for today. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Um, okay, let's let's see if there's some quick questions. I have a question. It's yeah. it's basically what I asked before. I'm still a bit confused about how you can perform the OPE for a four point function in two different ways. Maybe it would help me if you could just draw an example of four points on the plane mm -hmm. where you can perform the OP in two different ways. Cause I can't come up with an example. So, oh. 
a quintessential example is this. So this point one half is halfway between the S channel and T channel origins. Oh, so, so there you have a point that's zero, one half, one and infinity. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so I yeah. can, so, so here I'm setting Z equal to Z bar equal to a half. And this is within this circle and also within this circle. Sorry, that's, that shouldn't go out to infinity, of course, but uh, it's just, uh, it's supposed to be a unit circle. But yeah, that, that's the, the easiest. Well, so, um, so here example. I can see how you can fuse zero and one half and one and infinity, but then I don't see any other way you can, you can do it. Like you can do the OP oh. between zero and one half and you can do the OP uh -huh. between one and infinity because there it's within the radius of convergence. Mm -hmm. And then you can also do the OP between one half and one, but you wouldn't be able to fuse zero and infinity because it crosses the operator insertion at one or at sure. one half. Well, infinity is kind of everywhere, right? I mean, when yeah, we infinity, if you draw really this on a the point at infinity. Well, okay. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking of a point very far away, so at a very large mm -hmm. radial distance. You could go around distance. the other way there. You know. Yeah, but then you can't do it the other way. Like I, I know, but, but you you um you, you have a, a choice. So yeah, the sphere case you can in one channel you connect zero and infinity one way around the sphere, and then the other channel you connect them you connect infinity to a point you know, the other way around. Um, maybe I'm not being clear, but maybe we can talk about it uh, later. Um, I'd be happy well, to, maybe uh, maybe to avoid this issue of infinity, we can just draw four points that aren't at infinity because it should work, right? But I can't come up with a way to do it. Um, but we can talk about it later if you want to move on to another question. Sure, that might be better, but yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. More questions? Um, okay, if if not, then uh, let's thank Eric. Stop.